Welcome to Season 4 of Adventures in the Spirit with Jared Lasky. This podcast is not just information, but impartation and activation. We believe that every conversation will encourage, equip, and empower you to live the daily supernatural life. Subscribe to this podcast and then share every episode with your friends and family and be activated. Do you believe we are living in the end times? Are we seeing the signs of the times Jesus talked about with wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes? With recent events of social unrest on the streets worldwide, a pandemic, and the shaking taking place in the political realm, we want to answer your questions and calm your fears by giving you hope through our e-course, The Last Days, A Reformation in Eschatology. You can go through the e-course on your time, diving deep into learning how to study apocalyptic and prophetic passages of Scripture. You'll do a study on the mark of the beast and learn about the signs of the times Jesus spoke about in Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, and hear what the major views of the end times are and learn what the rapture really is. We will lay a grounded and biblical answer to a number of your questions about the end times, and you'll learn if Bible codes are real, and you'll hear if the Shemitah applies to us today, and make up your own mind if the United States of America is prophesied in the Bible. I want to give you a warning. This e-course, The Last Days of Reformation and Eschatology, may shatter your worldview and what you have been traditionally taught about the end times. Go to www.charismacourses.com to purchase The Last Days of Reformation and Eschatology with Jared Lasky e-course today. And guys, welcome to Adventures in the Spirit. I'm your host, Jared Lasky. Guys, this is, I'm not really going to jump in on promoting anything right now. I want Jonathan Feldstein. I have him here. He's the founder of the Genesis 123 Foundation and the Inspiration from Zion podcast. He is in Israel. I would like to get insights from him about what is taking place on the ground there as we are praying for wisdom, for peace, for uh, Holy Spirit intervention. And we're praying for the innocent people who are losing their lives right now. And 100% Israel has every right to defend itself. Israel has every right to defend itself. I don't see how anybody could support terrorism and try to justify what is taking place. This is a horrific situation. And um, Israel needs our prayers. Palestine needs our prayers. Everybody needs our prayers. But self-defense is is necessary in this tragic time. But Jonathan, um, give us an update on what is taking place and uh, what what is on the ground at the moment. Because I know that there's been a declaration of war. Yep. And there might be a ground invasion in the coming hours, days here real quick in the Gaza Strip. Yeah, well, first of all, Jared, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I've been uh, I've been losing sleep over, over conversations like this the last number of days because it's really so important that people understand what's going on and hear the truth. Um, because we, we are in for, I believe, um, some storm before the calm. Uh, this is, we're not, we're not even... I don't think at the worst yet, although what we've been suffering has been tremendous. Um, I'll just recap briefly. Saturday morning here, Israel time, at about 6.20, uh, Hamas terrorists opened with a barrage of rockets. I've heard 2,000. I've heard 3,000. Um, that, that barrage was probably covering for the beginning of their both their, their invasion of Israeli territory, by land, by sea, and by air. They had these little propeller crafts that brought in two terrorists at a time over the border, but they also bulldozed the border. And I don't know the number yet, but it has to be intuitively thousands of people who, who streamed in. Many of them were armed and armed very, very seriously. And some of them may have been just tag along uh, and not armed, but, but terrorists no less. Um, what happened in the wake now, because it was Saturday, Sabbath, and I'm an Orthodox Jew, we were offline. We didn't know what was going on. Um, the window behind me opens out to a beautiful view of the West and about 40 miles as the crow flies straight West, almost West Southwest a little bit is, uh, is the Gaza Strip. It's a good distance, but at nine o'clock in the morning, we were jolted out of bed. I overslept. I should have been in, in, in uh, synagogue that morning, but I way overslept. We were jolted out of bed by air raid sirens 50 yards out across the street um, right behind us. My wife and I jumped out of bed. We ran downstairs to our bomb shelter. All Israeli homes, new construction, have, have bomb shelters required. Uh, that's standard construction here in Israel, everywhere in the country. Uh, my youngest daughter, my youngest son were home. We all met up in my 
other son's room, which serves as our bomb shelter. Because it was the Sabbath, the light was off and we didn't turn the light on. So we sat in the dark room waiting for the siren, waiting for the for the inevitable explosion, hopefully of the Iron Dome blowing the rocket that was coming into our neighborhood out of the air. And we heard that it shook our shook our building. That repeated itself three other times Saturday morning um, to the point that my son, who's 18, and anyone who has a teenage son understands this, um, decided he was going to go back to sleep in his brother's room because he was tired of getting out of his own bed to have to run into the bomb shelter. So that's just kind of a little bit of humor in our in our reality, a, a, as fearful as the reality is. We still didn't know what was going on, but we live on the seventh floor of a, a, a of a, the top floor of an apartment building here. And what we saw from the east and from the west were a, a much larger number of vehicles um, than we would ever see on a typical Shabbat because we're, we're offline on computers, we're offline on phones, TV, we're not doing any kind of uh, labor um, and we're not driving our cars. So to see all these vehicles, we knew something was going on. If a rocket's coming this far, 40, km, 40 miles, 45 miles probably from where the, for the closest that they may be firing rockets at us from, you know something's going on and we knew something was going on and we spent hours speculating until 4 p.m. Saturday afternoon when my oldest son, whose room we'd been hiding out in repeatedly, came in. He's a newlywed. He was married in uh, the first week of, of July. He came in and he said, I need to pick up my uniform and my mm. um, equipment because I've been called up. He's a paratrooper. We expected that, but we didn't know that that was going to happen as soon. We also expected that my son-in-law, who is in a in a much different non-combat position, but a very high-end position, that he was would be called up immediately. So shortly after that, my wife and daughter walked over to my uh, other daughter's house. She has three kids under five. You can imagine how stressful it is. You're under attack. Your husband's now been called up to go into the army. And you're home alone with three little kids. There's a lot of stress that's going on. So my wife and daughter went over there, but it was only then at four o'clock that we understood that there had been this border breach, that we that they that I don't even know if we knew that they had come in by land and air as well. And at that time, my son, I believe, told us that there were about a hundred people on our side who were who were uh, murdered. What we've learned since it's now um, I don't know what day I don't even know what day it is. Sorry, it's been a blur. A couple of days. Monday. It's Monday. So it's two and a half days since this took place. Over 800 Israelis have been murdered. And I use the word murdered. It's not killed in war. These are, right. these are terrorists who've come in, who have infiltrated our communities, in some cases took over communities for a period of time. And, and I believe um, as of when I came home this afternoon, there were still terrorists camped out in these communities and firefights with them. But they took over and they were shooting people ra at random in the street. And they were going door to door, breaking into homes trying to get into the safe rooms, the, the bomb shelters of people in these communities and killing them in front of their own relatives. This is, this is everything about it is not, not only not combat, it is inhuman. It is a war crime on every conceivable level. And then in addition to killing people in their homes, for instance, there was one concert that had been an all night concert that was taking place. Obviously that's a bunch of young people out near not far from the Gaza border, how the terrorists knew that these young people were there, probably a couple of thousand of them. And they showed up and, and like you would imagine in a shooting gallery, open fire with automatic weapons, spraying down people. Yesterday, my son, I, I came out of my office, my youngest son was here. He said, Abba, did you hear the death count went up from 400 to 600? And I said, how, how did that happen? Well, they found 240 bodies just in this field where, where young men and women were gunned down. We're now over 800. Now I wanna put that in perspective. 800 is a third approximately, a little, a little under over, about a third, a little under a third of those who were killed on September 11th, 2021. In a country of 300 million plus people, we're a country of less than 10 million people. The 800 who have been killed this week are more than, we've, than we experienced in the whole first week of the Yom Kippur War, which also started with a surprise attack 50 years ago on Friday. 
So we're experiencing a lot of trauma here right now. I've read reports, I don't know if it's true, that hundreds of thousands of, of Israelis have been called up into the army. And as you said, there may very well be a ground invasion. My son is a paratrooper. We know today that the army took away his phone. Um, that means he's, what, regardless of what he told us, that means that at best they don't want him interrupted and focusing on our text messages asking where he is and is he okay. And at worst, he may be going into Gaza. We don't know. Um, we don't know if and when there will be ground troops. We know there have been strategic air attacks. And I want to say this, because it's going to get bad, and it's going to get bloody, and it's going to get bloodier on both sides. Right now, we've been absorbing that. There have been far more Israelis who have been killed than there have been Palestinian Arabs, even the terrorists. But when we start hitting back, they're going to be civilian casualties, which is why Israeli leaders, I said it the first day, but Israeli leaders are now telling any civilian, get out of Gaza, go to Egypt, go to the beach, wherever you can get out of these populated areas. Because another war crime is that the Hamas terrorists build their infrastructure and their bunkers and hide their weapons in the midst of populated areas for under hospitals. So we know this is the case and we know in order to get there, which we've resisted for all these years, it means we have to go in to heavily populated civilian areas. And never ever is Israel attacking to try and get uh, to, to, to have civilian casualties. In fact, the opposite. We've called off operations when there might be too, too many civilian casualties. But as you said, this is an unprecedented attack. Um, not only do we, we must we um, defend ourselves and but but there's an even higher level of self-defense that must be um, considered, which is the, the the restoration of deterrence. Right now, the terrorists in Gaza, the terrorists in Hezbollah in Lebanon, which have 150,000 estimated rockets, long range, much more accurate rockets than they have in Gaza. And their leaders and their financiers in, in Iran are looking at this and licking their chops and saying, this is our opportunity. We need to we need to continue to pulverize Israel. But what needs to happen, and that's why there's probably going to be a lot more bloodshed among innocent Palestinian Arabs, and I say that regrettably, um, is that in order to restore deterrence and make sure nobody ever will think about this again, we're going to have to go in with much more force than we've ever done before. Yeah, wow. Jonathan, thank you so much for sharing. There's how cowardly for them to attack on a Sabbath, on a Shabbat. Yeah. How cowardly. And and there are TikTok videos that are oh. just, I, I've seen videos of the people in the field running. And this is the first war besides, there were some videos from the Ukrainian conflict, uh, but this is the first social media war that we're seeing it live in real time on social media. Uh, some of these things, kids should not be on TikTok. Oh, kids should not be on X. Uh, these are adult things. These are tragic. And I saw this horrible, horrible story about a woman who survived the Holocaust being dragged in a wheelchair, uh, kidnapped by Hamas, these terrorists. So I condemn these terrorists. I, I, it's cowardly. You know, the, the Biden administration, you know, uh, I don't tend to get political on this podcast, but I am upset with Biden's deal to freeze up money to Iran, yeah. who started planning yeah. this attack, yeah. who's funding it, financing it. Um, how we need more wisdom over our administration. There are Americans who've been captured. What does that do for geopolitical things? Uh, we can't negotiate with terrorists. Benjamin Netanyahu just told Biden today that they're not going to negotiate with terrorists. Biden has a totally different philosophy. We'll probably try to negotiate, but this can flare up into worse, especially yeah. if American special ops have to get involved. That would flare up more across the Middle East. So I'm praying for peace. So Jonathan, um, what is what is your son's name? His name is Natan. Natan, Jesus. Touch Natan. Protect him in Jesus' name. Protect him in Jesus' name. You know, I, I've served in the Marine Corps in the military, so I understand operational security. And, uh, you know, I want people to keep praying, keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem, keep praying for wisdom for the leaders. You know, I believe that this can end quickly, swiftly, but uh, it, the, the Benjamin Net Netanyahu and others will, will need wisdom. 
I, I do think that Hamas will be routed and, you He's know, God. but there, there needs to be a lot more prayers from us Christians rather. What, what, what can, what are some things that Christians can do? Well, first of all, you know, you and I, and, and I've been, I said before we started formal conversation, you've been so gracious because you wanted to have this conversation with me for about a day now. And I've been so busy and I, and I just posted on my face, my personal Facebook, I, I've been in back-to-back -back media interviews and prayer events. I just came off a prayer event with Christian friends in Sweden. Yesterday, I did one in Nepal. Uh, I posted something from a dear friend, uh, a member of parliament in South Africa, and another dear friend in Chicago who is an Assyrian. We're seeing tremendous support around the world for now, and I know it's going to be rock solid among Christians, but Christians need to hear what's going on because I don't know when... But at some point, the world support, the 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 uh, governments that are standing firm with Israel now, are going to be getting very uncomfortable when there's a little too much Palestinian Arab blood running in the streets in Gaza. And I don't say that because I want that, but I just believe that that's going to be inevitability. Um, mm -hmm. What Christians can do is to pray. We need to pray for the soldiers, not just my son, but all of them, and understand that. All of them have at least left parents and siblings. But like my son, he's a newlywed. In, in Deuteronomy, I had to reread this yesterday. In Deuteronomy 24, 5, I think it is, soldiers, yeah. are, young men who are married are not supposed to be going out to war. That's one of our negative commandments. Don't send your sons who are newly married to war. They're supposed to be home with their wives. But now my daughter-in-law is home in her family's, in her parents' house fretting with no with, with with nothing and not knowing where her husband is and my daughter with three children and there are tens of thousands of us and our parents you know and my son we raised him right he we're proud of him but we're scared you know he could be he could be going in and Hamas is prepared and they booby trapped stuff and when he left here he was in and out in about 15 minutes and we packed food for him and got him all his stuff his last words walking out of the house were don't worry and my and he shut the door and my wife looked at me and said, "Yeah, wait till you have a son who goes off to war and then and then say, "Don't worry." Of course, we're worrying. It's sickening. So pray for that and pray for the. Uh, I'm I'm so glad you mentioned it. We do need to pray for our leaders here in Israel and yes, the Biden administration. They need to have their come to Jesus moment because honestly, how they can sit back now and not recognize that emboldening Iran, which is the leader of all of the terrorists in the world, with $6 billion uh, yeah. just last month, $6 billion, that it wasn't going to embolden the rest of the terrorists? Of course it is. They need to understand that this can't happen. In a previous interview I did today, even in America, the borders there are not, are, are not safe, and America needs to be prayed for. And others, I, I was in Europe this summer. I know you spent some time in Europe uh, earlier this year as well. We're seeing an infiltration of, of, of hateful extremism, and I'm sorry to say it, it's mostly Arab and mostly Islamic, but that's the reality in our world today. And pray for that. And the other thing, and I'm just going to ask shamelessly, certainly follow me and, and, and connect. I'm providing as many updates as I can, and I'm, that's why I'm so grateful to you, Jared, for giving me this opportunity. But we established an emergency fund with the Genesis 123 Foundation, and people can go to love.genesis123.co and make a donation, and we want that. And I'll and I'll explain in a moment where we're going to be putting that money. And today, by the way, I got a $10,000 matching grant, so the first $10,000 are being matched. But we're also giving you the opportunity to send your prayers, to send your words of encouragement. And with every interaction we have, whether it's with soldiers or at-risk youth, who are now suffering in the Gaza area, or gee, I forgot what the other, or civilian security, because we need to pump up um, first responders, civilian security in these border communities. So these are the three main areas that we're focusing on. And anywhere we go, I'm going to be photocopying, wow, I'm showing my age, uh, photocopying and, and, and handing these things out to know that this support is coming from Christians who love us from all over the world. And and you know me, you know me well enough, uh, Jared. We're putting all that funds directly to causes that I can identify are going to make the best impact. Um, but the prayers, knowing the truth, standing up for the truth, not equivocating, not allowing someone to spew anti-Israel hatred, calling your 
your representatives no. um, from your from from the White House. It's a free call. Call the White House. Call the vice president's office. Call your governor. Call your senators. Call your uh, your congress congressperson and tell them that you expect unequivocal support and that Israel needs to do business and it's not going to be pretty. And and, and I'll just end on this. We have plenty of wars in in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and they're not pretty, but they're biblical. And we follow special rules of engagement. We're going to do it at our best level to minimize civilian casualties, but we must defend ourselves and we must restore deterrence. And and I'm just grateful for this opportunity and for everybody listening and following this um, who can join us in prayer. Yes, sir. That, friends, that was Jonathan Feldstein, Inspiration from Zion podcast and the Genesis 123 Foundation with a real look on the ground, real perspective from Israel. I want to encourage you guys to support him. Genesis 123 Foundation, just as he shared, go to his website. I think JonathanFeldstein.com. No, Gen- Genesis123.co. Genesis123.co. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for being my special guest on Adventures. Thank you, Jared. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening to Adventures in the Spirit with Jared Lasky, a podcast that activates you to live the supernatural life. Subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and share it with your friends. Leave a five-star rate and review, which helps us reach more people with the love and power of the Holy Spirit and partner with us at firebornministries.com. And may you live your best spirit-empowered life and have your own adventures in the Holy Spirit.